My name is Sam Vaknin and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. This is a serious opening because it's a serious video. Today we are going to discuss love bombing and grooming and narcissists and sadists and sadistic narcissists. And what's the common denominator to all these? You. You are in the crosshair. You just don't know it. It's like being the victim of a sniper. By the time you get to know it, you are usually dead. So today we are going to discuss the techniques that lead into your heart. The way the narcissist, the sadist, the sadistic narcissist, the psychopath, and I told you in the last video that I make no distinctions between these allegedly separate mental health disorders. But how these people make inroads, how they penetrate your defenses, how they scan your vulnerabilities, the chinks in your armor, and then home in on, on these, like cruise missiles. Heat seeking, your heat, the heat of your body, the heat of your soul. So, you are a target. Everyone is a target. Perhaps this is the dawning realization, especially during this pandemic when people finally had time to sit alone by themselves and think and realize that they are being targeted by narcissists and psychopaths all the time and they, that they had been targeted since the inception of life. Narcissists and psychopaths are everywhere by conservative estimates. 5% of the population are narcissistic or psychopathic. Possibly 10% if we add in grandiose borderlines and so on and so forth. That's a lot of people. That's one in every 10 people you know. And so you should wise up to their techniques and, and so on. And today we're going to discuss two of these, love bombing and grooming. Love bombing is the intense flooding with messages of love, attention, admiration, adulation, etc., etc. In short, it is the written form or the visual form of idealization. The love bombing victim or the love bombing target is simply inundated, drowns in messages, an endless stream of messages, which, uh, which doesn't leave, doesn't let the target Think. The aim of love bombing is to deny the faculty of thought, critical thought, critical thinking. It's by occupying the target's entire attention span, every minute of, it, of, it, of her time, the love bomber doesn't allow her to sit back and evaluate what's happening. And so love bombing has four functions. First of all, to signal to the target the, in, the intensity and the persistence of the interlocutor's or correspondence ostensible emotions. The higher the number of messages I'm sending you, the more florid, the more florid and effervescent the language, the more it's an indicator and a signal of how deeply I feel about you. It is intended to chart and to document the growing all-pervasive attachment that the narcissist or the love bomber allegedly feels. The second function is virtue signaling. It is intended to convey the purity and the authenticity, as well as the good intentions of the love bomber. I love you. I adore you. I worship you. I will never hurt you. The third element is gaslighting. The idea in love bombing is to engender, to foster, to create, and then to impose on the target an immersive virtual reality bubble. I repeat, virtual reality bubble. It's not real. And within this bubble, there's a cult-like shared fantasy, or even in extreme cases, shared psychosis. This is established by the love bomber, and then it takes hold. And it's very difficult as a target to extricate yourself from these agreed upon conventions rules of conduct and speech, things that are acceptable and not acceptable, 
things that you're allowed to do and not allowed to do. And gradually, the love bomber constricts your world, narrows it, closes you down, disconnects you from other people. We'll come to it when we talk about grooming. And the fourth aim of, of love, bombing, love bombing is to induce the target to enter the hall of mirrors where she is idealized. Remember that I consistently suggest that the narcissist does not exist. There's nobody there. The narcissist is a reification, the embodiment, the personification of emptiness. It's, it's a walking, talking void. It's deep space. When you look into the eyes of the narcissist, you can see forever. There's nothing to stop your gaze. There's nobody there. There's no back wall. It's like infinite regression, regression with mirrors. So the narcissist is a hall of mirrors. And the narcissist invites you in, into this hall of mirrors. And then you look around and you see yourself reflected a thousand times and then a million times. And this is, of course, the essence of idealization. Idealization means amplification, making you bigger, making you more grandiose, making you omnipresent everywhere. And so when you enter the narcissist hall of mirror, mirrors, you're idealized and you become infatuated with your own rendition. You become infatuated with yourself. And this is by far the most addictive experience imaginable. And it results in something we, we call operant conditioning. You, are, you become like Pavlov's dogs. Every time you receive a message from the love bomber, there is this, there is this aggrandizement. There is this sense of infinite possibilities. There is this a atmosphere, ambience of adventure and risk and thrill. And, and you, you can't extricate yourself. You can't, it's, it's, it's absolutely like a drug. It's a drug. It grants the love bomber with the power to withhold access to this contraption. And because you are already addicted, withholding access induces in you withdrawal symptoms, kind of cold turkey. And so the love bomber acquires, with his love bombing, acquires a tool, an instrument to modify your behavior via intermittent reinforcement. You're a good girl. I'll grant you access to my hall of mirrors. I'll continue to flood you, flood you with messages, messages that make you, make you look imperfect, brilliant, omnipotent, omniscient, etc. So the love bomber harps plays on your own narcissism. In effect, what the love bomber does, it gradually transforms you and converts you into a narcissist. It's like a vampire. Love bombing is like this proverbial bite on your neck when you're inf infected with vampirism and you're going to live forever. You're going to live forever and you're going to wander the earth and you're going to see the most amazing things and suddenly all possibilities are open. You feel a sense of liberation, a sense of infinite capacity, a sense of self-actualization that you had never felt before, before and above all, maybe the first time in your life, you love, you're in love with yourself. The love bomber is nothing but a conduit, a channel. You're channeling yourself through the love bomber. And so love bombing is the narcissist's prime, prime entry strategy. Gradually, you will have to develop an exit strategy if you want to survive. The narcissist's entry strategy is love bombing. There is a substantial difference, though, between love bombing and grooming. And people tend to confuse the two, especially self-styled experts and so on online. Grooming is a pathological technique, pathological strategy, which leads to criminalized, antisocial, or aggressive, violent acts. So a pedophile grooms his targets or his victims, the children he is about to abuse, molest, or exploit sexually. That's what a pedophile does. A sadist grooms his victims. Grooming leads to acts 
of extreme egregious abuse, usually including violation of physical boundaries. Love bombing is an entirely different thing. Love bombing is a conditioning technique, a conditioning strategy. You know who is love bombing you? Facebook is love bombing you. Every time you get a like on your posts, that's a love bomb, um, a mini bomb, but it's a love bomb. The more likes you get on your Facebook post, the more you are being love bombed. So the principle of love bombing also underlies social media, where there is ersatz simulated love via likes, via emojis, and so on and so forth. Of course, Facebook is not grooming you, it's conditioning you, it's creating an addiction. It's making it difficult for you to extricate yourself by leveraging and making use of the dopamine pathway in your brain. The same, narcissist does the same, but there's a big difference between the narcissist and the sexual sadist, who is also a narcissist. A sexual sadist will groom you. And there's a, the difference between love bombing and grooming is, is substantial. Because grooming is intended to achieve six goals. And remember, grooming is mostly done by a person who displays symptoms of narcissism, psychopathy, and sadism. A kind of dark triad of a different sort. And again, grooming is intended to achieve six goals. The first one is to establish mastery, a power hierarchy, an external locus of control over you, so that you feel that you have surrendered your life, that you have surrendered control over yourself, your decision-making processes, everything to the outside, to that person. Number two in grooming, to mold the target into a mindless and obedient um, role play. So if it's a woman, the sexual sadist would usually, usually would try to mold her into an unthinking whore, satisfy his sexual fantasies without any limit, without any boundary, without ever saying no. The third function of grooming is to overcome the target's natural revulsion and anxiety. When, when normal people, when healthy people come across a narcissist, come across a psychopath or the sadist, they have this immediate, intuitive, reflexive unease. They feel discomfited and they don't know why. They, they, something is off-key. Some, some part of the tune is fake and wrong and they know it, but they can't put the finger on it. And Masahiro Mori, the Japanese roboticist, called it the uncanny valley. He said that when robots would come to resemble human beings um, very highly, very much, we would begin to feel unease with these robots because they are too, too human. It's the same with narcissists and psychopaths and sadists. They are, in essence, forms of artificial intelligence. They lack the, they lack the basics of being human. But they look human. They imitate and simulate emotions, cognitions, reactions, behaviors perfectly. Yet we feel that something is missing. We feel that it's a simulation, that it's not real, that it's feigned, that it's a forgery of some kind, a counterfeit. And so there's immediate revulsion and anxiety. And grooming is intended to overcome these reactions by habituating the target co-opting or hijacking the target's fantasy life, injecting, injecting, it's the, the sadist injects himself into the subject's imagination, fears, hopes, wishes, dreams, fantasies, becomes an integral and inseparate part of these things. The fourth function is to expose the target to brainwashing, messaging and signaling. Repetition does that. Repetition. And then co-opting, pretending to have an unspoken, uh, unverbalized, ambient agreement about some things, even if, if the agreement is never made explicit. So there are sanctions for breach of, for, for misconduct, for breach of this unspoken uh, atmospheric agreement. 
and it's a part of brainwashing. It's intermittent, intermittent reinforcement. You abide by the rules, you follow the conventions and the mores that we had agreed on, God knows when, then I'm going to re reward you. You don't, I'm going to punish you. And there are numerous ways to punish. Silent treatment is the most prevalent. The fifth role of grooming is to push the target, to dismantle her boundaries, to abrogate her values and morals, and to violate her own role, rules of conducts, conduct and her own decisions about her life, her goals, her, her the way acceptable things, non-acceptable things, and so on, to, to, to transform, to shapeshift the target so that she is totally disoriented. Her life becomes a kaleidoscope. She's no longer sure um, um, what she believes in. She can't be absolutely certain where her boundaries are and what she is going to do or not going to do under extreme circumstances. And so this is inducing a borderline personality disorder-like state where there is identity diffusion, like multiple personality. Grooming does that to you. And the sixth role is to isolate you from family and social network. The more isolated you are, the more dependent you are on the source of the grooming. So put together, grooming creates a shared psychotic space within which the shared fantasy thrives on false promises and false premises. And there's a make-believe role play whenever the woman tries to exit this common territory, this common delusional territory, she's punished. If there is physical proximity, she's punished with sadistic sex, egregious abuse, withholding, outright rejection, humiliation. If it's electronic or digital communication, there's silent treatment. There are mocking messages. There are threats. And finally, the only way open to her is to resort to another man with whom she can create an alternative sanctuary, however, however fantastic, however brief. And so many, many, many such women cheat, and the shared fantasy is irrevocably undermined. And this creates in the narcissist or sadist or psychopath mortification. And the woman is now perceived as a threat and she is shunned. Mission accomplished. The cheating is one strategy. Betrayal, I would say, is a more generalized strategy. Cheating is one strategy, but for example, challenging the premises and the foundations of the shared fantasy. Um, not agreeing, not agreeing to serve anymore as a source of narcissistic supply. Mocking and deriding the, the narcissist's grandiosity. Humiliating the narcissist in public in front of peers, colleagues, and so on. I mean, there are quite a few strategies, quite a few exit strategies from the shared fantasy or shared psychosis, but they all involve a kind of betrayal. Betrayal of trust, betrayal of unspoken, unspoken uh, compacts and agreements, betrayal of expectations, dreams, hopes, and fantasies, which at some point are shared, betrayal of the power hierarchy um, challenging the narcissist's superiority, challenging the sadist's access to to body to the body, etc. So all these are exit strategies. Now the question is how do narcissists decide who to target and how do sadists decide who to target? And there are numerous typologies and numerous explanations. There is the absolutely nonsensical concept of empath. Um, I have a video dedicated to debunking this uh, media hype uh, inanity. There are uh, there is the, the the misinformation, the wrong information that narcissists target only specific types of of people and magnets or and so on and so forth. That's absolutely wrong. Research has consistently shown that the only parameter, the only parameter that interests a narcissist is whether the potential mate, potential partner can provide narcissistic supply or not. End of story. 
the narcissist targets autonomous, independent, entrepreneurial, strong women, and the narcissist targets weak, um, not very bright, uh, underaccomplished women. The narcissist targets codependence, and he targets totally healthy women. Narcissist targets everyone. Narcissist canvases and scans. Anyone can provide supply? She's a target. And she is targeted. There is no type constancy and no preference for any type of profile. This is a myth and utter misinformation. But the narcissist does divide women to a variety of typologies. I've dwelt upon some of these typologies in other videos, and today I would like to introduce yet another one. The narcissist divides all women into homemakers, promiscuous women, and promiscuous glamorous women. And so when he's uh, cheated on, abandoned, betrayed, challenged, mocked, humiliated, and so on. When the, the intimate partner tries to exit the shared fantasy, which had become dangerous or ominous or threatening or debilitating, or, and she has to exit. I mean, she can't stand it anymore. When this happens, most narcissists experience a variety of reactions. And one of these reactions is called narcissistic mortification. I've dedicated four videos for recently to the issue of mortification, how the narcissist experiences, experiences mortification, what is the role of mortification, why narcissists seek mortification, etc. etc. But the thing is that narcissists experience mortification only with the homemaker, with the homemaker type of partner. The the type of partner that the narcissist um, can uh, that the narcissist believes can be a stable, long-term, intimate partner who is focused on adulation and services, less on sex. Remember, there are three S's, sex, supply, services. The homemaker is focused on, uh, on supply and services. And she's stable, she's, she's homely, she's domestic, she's a service provider, she's loving, she's, you know, and she's very trustworthy so when something happens with her the narcissist is mortified and then he tries to transform his external mortification into an, into an internal one he says to himself she's not like that or she's not to blame for her misconduct it's my fault my abuse and withholding pushed her to the limit he overlooks any facts to the contrary including the homemaker partner's past promiscuity and a pattern of betrayal and sexual and emotional licentiousness in her past. He idealizes her. So the first target for love bombing could be a home maker, a home body um, kind of target, kind of woman, which would fit into this uh, narrative, idealized narrative. Another type of woman the narcissist would tend to love bomb is the promiscuous, glamorous woman. It's a beautiful woman, entrepreneurial, strong on the surface, autonomous, um, adventurous, risk taker, thrill seeking, a bit psychopathic. And with this kind of woman, the narcissist experiences both retroactive and reactive romantic jealousy. In other words, he is jealous of her past intimate partners and romantic partners and one night stand partners and whatever. And he's jealous of current uh, possible competitors for her love and attention. Owning this kind of partner who could have chosen any man because she is, you know, drop dead gorgeous and, and rich. Or, so owning this kind of partner upholds the narcissist's grandiosity, makes him feel unique, irresistible upholds his sense of virility. Narcissists have very strong problems with gender differentiation and gender roles. They are not quite sure how manly they are. They keep testing. So owning such a partner sort of upholds virility. And losing her challenges both grandiosity and manhood or manliness. So it's a big blow for the narcissist. But narcissists would tend to love bomb this kind of target into submission. And finally, there's the promiscuous only partners. Narcissist with this kind of partner is less likely to love bomb 
is likely to team up with his partner, but love bombing is usually not a part of the of the package because he feels nothing and experiences no reaction. First of all, with this kind of partner, cheating is both expected and accepted as a way out of the uh, shallow relationship, which included fun and sex. And because it's it's um, kind of a transient stopgap partner. Transient doesn't mean short, it could be years, but it's a stopgap partner. N not, not the glamorous promiscuous and not the homemaker, which are the stable partners of the narcissist. So with this kind of partner, love bombing is much less, um, much less likely. And it is this kind of partner that the narcissist picks up in bars and restaurants and conferences and, and so on and so forth. So this is the narcissist. But believe me, the narcissist is harmless compared to the next type I'm going to discuss. The worst, most egregious, hurtful and dangerous type of narcissist, really of any person in my view, is also antisocial, psychopathic and a sadist. Uh, such a narcissist is the sad and corrupted outcome of intermittent reinforcement in early childhood, which resulted in a shattering and never resolved narcissistic modification. Let me try to explain. All narcissists start as children. It may come as a shock to you, but they do. So, some, some people, some of these children, are first idolized, placed on a pedestal, pampered, cosseted, admired, exhibited, and they could do no wrong. They are perfection, reified. And so these children are exposed to unconditional parental worship, not love. Unconditional parental worship, but coupled with conditional love. In other words, as long as the child performs, the worship is unconditional and unlimited. It has no boundaries. The, the parent actually merges with the child, fuses with the child, which makes it very difficult for the child to separate and individuate and have boundaries. But the love is conditional. And then, abruptly, these children are cast aside, uh, pushed off the pedestal, shunned, discarded, mocked, nightmarishly abused in every which manner, sadistically criticized, ostentati ostentatiously hated. And so the this incredibly sudden transition from, from hero to zero, from God to the least low-life scum creature on earth, this transition, remember, it happens to a child who is four years old, nine years old, six years old. This kind of transition is difficult even for an adult. We have studies of, of chief executive officers, very rich businessmen and famous people who went to jail. Harvey, Harvey Weinstein types, you know, they were at the top of the world, at the pinnacle of their industry. They control the universe. They own the universe. They were masters of the universe. And then, you know, they're in jail in the general population. And we studied their psychology and it, it is an incredible uh, crisis. It's it's an existential multiplication. Now, this is when it happens to an adult. Adult has boundaries, has experience, has, has, is much stronger, is much more resilient. Imagine when it happens to a four-year-old. It's absolutely shattering, pulverizing. And so this creates such, such abrupt pendulum, pendular shift. It creates antisocial, sadistic narcissism. It's a sub 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 species, sub group, sub variant, which are by far the most dangerous because they unify all the bad qualities of the narcissist. The lack of, including the lack of reality testing, in other words, the psychotic elements in narcissism, the delusional elements, combined with antisocial traits and behaviors, including defiance, lack of impulse control, recklessness, callousness. Lack of empathy, extreme lack of empathy, uh, coupled with psychological penetration. And 
with the urges, uncontrollable urges of the sadist to hurt people, to enjoy the pain inflicted on people. So when you put all three together, you can imagine what you get. And these type of narcissists will stop at nothing to recapture the Garden of Eden ideal state that they had started life with. Remember at the beginning, they were put on a pedestal, pampered, spoiled, worshipped. They want to recapture this state. This is their Garden of Eden from which they had been expelled. This was the ideal state they want to go back to, they want to revert to. So in women, this type of narcissist look for an idealizing mother. They want all women to become mother and to recreate the ideal space, the shared fantasy that I mentioned before. And when the partner fails to do this, they try to fix the intimate partner by force, coercive, coercively, using, among other things, abuse. And so to to convert, to transform the, the woman or the intimate partner into an idealizing mother, this kind of narcissist uses extreme grooming. You remember the six, the six uh, roles or six aims of, of grooming? Narcissists, this kind of narcissist, use grooming to the point of negating the partner's identity and existence, annulling her, vitiating her. Um, and then assimilating the remnants. So they kind of mummify the partner and then digest the partner. partner becomes not only an extension like with a classical narcissist, but a part of the sadistic antisocial narcissist. And so abandonment in this case would be the equivalent of amputation. You see, the woman, the intimate partner, becomes uh, is absolutely not a distinct entity, but another organ, like skin. And this kind of narcissist, sadistic and antisocial, they generate a shared fantasy space into which they shoehorn everyone else. Not only everything I'm saying here does not only apply to romantic partners, intimate partners, love interests. It applies to business partners, colleagues, neighbors, uh, you know. This kind of sadistic antisocial narcissist tries to recreate the ideal, the ideal space, the Garden of Eden, where he used to be God, where he used to walk the earth as a divinity, worshipped by, by these godlike creatures, the parents. You know, he wants to recreate this and he wants to recreate it in the workplace in his family, among his neighbors, in the pub, wherever he goes, he creates pathological narcissistic spaces, physical spaces within which he is trying, trying to restore the primordial st uh, state. And any attempt to exit this space, or to challenge this space, or to modify this space, or in any way, shape or form interfere with this space, it leads to extreme aggression. And the aggression can be so extreme, it could, it could end with murder. It's, it's, it could easily transition to violence, especially under the influence of substance abuse. There's a replay, because when the shared fantasy or the shared space, in the case of these narcissists, is challenged, it's a replay of the original narcissistic modification with mother. It's a replay it's a reenactment of the unresolved conflict, the unresolved expulsion from the Garden of Eden with the flaming swords. It's the most traumatic experience by far in the narcissist's life. And every time a woman, a boss, a, co a colleague or peers or try to dismantle the fantastic space, the, fan the shared fantasy, the shared psychosis, the cult. Every time they try to bring the narcissist, this kind of narcissist, sadistic and psychopathic narcissist, back to reality. Every time they try to open his eyes, to disabuse him of his delusions, they are actually assuming the role 
of the original abusing mother, the original angel who cast the narcissist out of the Garden of Eden in, into a life of toil and pain. But you can say what, what determines whether the narcissist experiences narcissistic mortification or merely narcissistic injury or even just searing romantic jealousy when his partner misbehaves, for example, with other men, which is the most egregious and extreme form of abandonment and betrayal. What determines the reaction? Well, mortification occurs when the rejection is total, when it's abrupt, when it's ostentatious in public, and when the, the narcissist needs his partner the most. It is a stark reminder of the narcissist's power for self-delusion and gullibility. When this happens, the narcissist realizes how sick he is, how deformed, how defective, how dysfunctional. It's very painful. It's very painful. It's annihilating. It's a, it's a, a feeling of, of um, I mean, coming, coming face to face with yourself as a narcissist is coming face to face with the ultimate in monstrosity. And the narcissist doesn't consider himself a monster. On the contrary, considers himself a superior, irresistibly attractive um, proposition. And so, abandonment and betrayal, recreating the original abandonment and betrayal by mother, they force the narcissist to confront who he really, who he really is, or much more precisely, who he really is never and is not. Because the narcissist is a, an absence, not a presence. He's not an entity. He's a non-entity. He is not a room full of things. He is a hall of mirrors full of reflections. He is an abstraction, not a human being. How horrifying can it be to come to realize this when all your defenses crumble in a process known as decompensation, when all your delusions are taken away, challenged to the point of breaking? And so romantic jealousy is a normal reaction to the anticipated loss of a partner. Mortification is much more than this, and it has nothing to do with the partner. It has nothing to do with the partner. Mortification has to do exclusively with the narcissist and his ultimate and final confrontation with himself. The duel, you know, guns drawn. No one will, will stay, stay alive. So. Now, the sexual sadist fantasizes not about sex. It's a common misconception. Sexual sadism is not about sex, it's about power. It's about humiliating, trashing, and degrading the woman, the intimate partner. Conventional sex actually leads the sexual sadist to boredom and erectile dysfunction. And so there are three types of women in the world of the sexual sadist. And only types one and two acquiesce and cater to his sadistic needs. So the first type is a woman who, women who are submissive, and they are already deep, deeply in love or irresistibly infatuated with the sadistic, narcissistic, antisocial men. And to get to this stage, the sadist uses grooming. And these women require grooming to be brought to this stage, but when they are in this stage, grooming is no longer needed. They are utterly unthinking robots, and they would fulfill any and all sexual fantasies of the, of the sadist. The second group of women are promiscuous masochists. You can find them in sex clubs or through private networks. It takes some effort to find them. And there are huge risks involved usually, medical risks, personal risks. But they are the second type of women who would cater totally to the needs of the narcissistic, sadistic, sexual sadist. The thing is that women in casual sex, one night stands, pickups, pickups in bars, hookups. These kind of women would never agree to realize the sadist sexual fantasies. And they also usually demand reciprocity and equipotence 
there's a negotiated power symmetry when you pick up a woman in a bar for a one night stand. So this is not, not the narcissist cup of tea. It's definitely not what the sexual sadist is looking for. And so the sexual sadist obtains power in two ways. In the grooming phase, he establishes his mastery. And in the sexual phase, he exercises it. Sadists avoid, avoid one-night stands. So do narcissists, by the way. Contra, contra to misinformation online. Sadists, narcissists, psychopaths love casual sex and one-night stands. But sadists and narcissists, they avoid them. Because they are likely to be unfulfilling and may, merely provoke a performance anxiety. And casual sex also invariably ends up in a kind of narcissistic injury because the man is rejected or humiliated or abandoned. Or... So, um, within the category of narcissistic sexual sadists, there are those with a strong sex drive, hypersexual, and a weak sex drive, like in the normal population. And sexual sadists with a weak sex drive, they opt for massive sublimation. In other words, they convert the sexual energy into non-sexual, socially acceptable activities. Ironically, it's exactly this type of narcissistic sexual sadists who would engage in very prolific um, love bombing and grooming because it's a substitute for the sex itself. They don't really need the sex. The power turns them on, obtaining power over some other person, manipulating another person. That is the big turn on, frustrating another person, causing pain and hurt to another person, penetrating another person's defenses, pushing her to commit suicide. These, these are the big turn, on, turn ons. So sexual sadists with a weak sex drive sublimate, and they are the ones actually who engage in interminable, interminable love bombing and grooming, which leads nowhere. They tend to procrastinate, avoid face-to-face -face meetings, and so on and so forth. They only intermittently go for uh, the first type of women, submissive women, who are infatuated with they, they They actually try to avoid this. The problem is that women of the first type, submissive and infatuated, they require an intimate, committed relationship, which most uh, sadistic narcissists are not willing to embark on. Sadistic, psychopathic narcissists are looking merely for an admirer, a playmate, a lover, to fit into the shared fantasy. I've dedicated a few videos to this. They're looking for a toy because they're children. Most of them are stuck at age four, psychodynamically. The equipment they have, the emotional equipment they have, characterizes a child age four. So they're looking for a toy. And what do children do with toys? Break them, dismantle them, disassemble them, look in the innards, look inside. So narcissistic sexual sages are the same. They're, they're looking for a toy to dismantle. They're not looking for a wife. They're not looking to become a father. Many sages, of course, deceive the, the woman, make false promises to the contrary. And they, they promise everlasting love. They profess to lust. They say that they want, they're looking for intimacy in a relationship, in a marriage, they want to have children and so on. It's, this is standard fare. But they do this in order to secure the three S's, sex, supply and services. Some sexual sadists, some sadistic narcissists, they would go as far as getting married to a woman so as to secure her cooperation. Um, it's more rare, but it does happen, absolutely. I mean, there's no limit to how far they will go. So even when the sadist does find the appropriate, submissive, infatuated uh, woman, ultimately, when push comes to shove and he's unable to fulfill his false promises and commitments, the women become, become angry and disappointed and they end up adopting an exit strategy of betrayal, cheating on him in egregious cases or, you know, just humiliating him or challenging him. And this leads to a, an intricate power play within the, the relationship where the, the 
the chairs are, are the roles are reversed to some extent and the sadistic narcissist gets a taste of his own medicine and it leads to harrowing mortification time and again and so many narcissistic uh, sadistic narcissists ultimately decide that the prize the shared fantasy is not worth the price and the price is grooming and mortification so they exit the scene and this is why most sadistic narcissists go through inordinately long stretches of celibacy they're trying to avoid the mortification now i did say in previous videos that classic pure narcissists or narcissists who are comorbid with borderline in other words people who have both diagnoses narcissistic personality disorder and borderline personality disorder these narcissists are looking for mortification this mortification is the only time they are free of the false self the false self is disabled mortally wounded and the narcissist can finally experience his own identity and existence uh, directly not indirectly not via the mediation and the filtering of the false self so they seek it they seek mortification they seek to be abandoned abruptly and so on so forth but not so the sadistic narcissist so this is narcissist avoids mortification and because he knows that his brand of sexuality centered around around power matrices because he knows that his psychology uh, getting cheer and joy out of inflicting pain because he knows that these are unpalatable and unacceptable he knows that the relationship is always doomed well in advance he knows the sequence he's going to groom an intimate partner let's say a woman he's going to make false promises if need be he's going to inflict on her pain and hurt abuse her egregiously dismantle her ruin her identity and sense of of self boundaries everything deconstellate her if you wish this break her like a toy disassemble her she's going to tolerate this she's going to realize his sexual fantasies no matter how morbid and bizarre and paraphiliac and deviant and and sick so to speak she's going to comply with them it's going to do everything but she expects something in return and this something is a relationship it could be a committed relationship could be a marriage could be a formal relationship or informal relationship, but a relationship of some kind and when he fails to deliver this he knows that she's going to betray him and in majority of cases she's going to betray him with another man and she's going to do it in a way that will hurt him back he knows this he anticipates it he expects it and so he realizes that at the end of the road there is a life-threatening mortification and so a sadistic narcissist would try to avoid this his shared fantasy does not include a relationship with the classic narcissist or the narcissistic borderline the shared fantasy always includes a real core real, real kernel of a relationship not so with the sadistic narcissist there's no hint of, in his mind, there's no hint of a relationship. It's all about power, mastery, slave, slavery. Yeah. People with atypical sexuality often give up on sex altogether. Some of them do it in order to not hurt innocent people. So some of them, you know, don't engage in sex because they don't want to hurt lonely, fragile, broken women or they don't want to do anything bad to children so atypical sexuality very often leads to celibacy and abstinence or uh, sometimes they find it difficult it's 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 finding a partner requires excessive investment in of resources and unusual assuming unusual da dangers and risks or because the sex is likely to result in psychologically or physically dangerous and bad outcomes to themselves and to others and so on. Atypical sexuality gradually leads to isolation, to isolation, abstinence, avoidance, celibacy. It's self-imposed. It's very sad and very painful, but it's the only way to avoid um, a price which could lead to life-threatening outcomes. And so these sadistic sexual 
the sexually sadistic antisocial narcissists, they would substitute, they would sublimate their sex drive, their inability to have sex, and they will convert it to flirting, grooming, uh, love bombing, old, um, safe, safe pseudo sex, safe approximations of sex, sex by proxy, sex by, by word, verbalized sex. It's very, very, very close to pornography. You know, it's virtual, it's not real. And so, if you were to talk to a sadistic narcissist, he would tell you this. Like every narcissist, he would say, my only goal is narcissistic supply. But as a hybrid, antisocial narcissist and sadist, my exclusive form of supply is sadistic. I call it sadistic supply. Such a narcissist would say, I love to embarrass, humiliate, degrade and undermine people especially women. My sadism is grandiose. It gives me the feeling that I possess the power to so badly damage my devastated interlocutors and intimate partners that it proves to me that I'm omnipotent. It elates me. It's like a rush or a high. It is the confluence of fantastic personal inflation, buttressed by the visible impacts of my unmitigated, relentless and callous cruelty. Such a narcissist would say, I obtained sadistic supply with my aggressive, ostentatious and public defiance of everything my targets or victims hold dear and sacred. Their conventions, their plans, their hopes, their dreams, their wishes. First, I collude with their fantasies and dreams. I act the perfect accomplice, perfect mate, false advertising. But then I destroy everything we have built together with cold indifference and glee methodically, as though I were exclaiming, you can never take me for granted, for I am a force of nature. I will punish you, I ruin you for daring to humanize me, to reduce me to the level of mere mortals, for being so blind that you fail to grasp my divine superiority in every way. I do not need you, I do not, you don't have anything to offer to me. I will prove it to you by discarding you offhandedly. And so the the sexual sadist harps on people's insecurities, vulnerabilities, weaknesses, mercilessly. He pushes their buttons, he triggers them to the limits of decompensation, disintegration and acting out. All other forms of narcissistic supply and all other forms of psychopathic goals, admiration, recognition, sex, money, power, they are secondary, they are subordinate to the sadistic needs to the need to inflict pain and hurt, to the need to disassemble, break apart the toy of the sadistic narcissist. Sadistic narcissist sacrifices even classic narcissistic supply, sacrifices goals, undermines his own goals. From the outside, he appears to be self-defeating or self-destructive, but he does this in order to obtain the gratification of watching his target, his prey, his victim, unravel, of inflicting pain and suffering on them, frustrating them, countering their happiness and joy, and often in public. You see, the sadistic narcissist's self-destruction causes pain to his intimate partner. It's, it's a sadistic ploy. He destroys himself to spite the other. He destroys himself to cause hurt to cause the other to feel enormous sadness and sorrow and unmitigated, unadulterated depression. And so we, we see counterintuitive and very perplexing and paradoxical behaviors. For example, a sexual sadist will give up having sex with a woman, give it up, if he can instead frustrate her, reject her, humiliate and hurt her with his reluctance or with his refusal to respond to his signals, cues and advances. A woman would come on to him. A woman would offer herself. And his gratification would not be to take her on her offer. His gratification would not be to have sex with her, but to deny sex to her. Her evident pain is far great, a far greater aphrodisiac, far greater supply than anything sex with her can yield. 
And similarly, the sadistic narcissist will forego or sabotage great opportunities and rewards just so as to hurt and frustrate the hopes and expectations of others. Now, there is a very big difference between this and the psychopath's behavior. The psychopath does the same things. He frustrates, he hurts people, he, he has many self-destructive and self-defeating behaviors, he destroys his own opportunities, he rejects life, he forgoes and gives up the joys of life. He's a life negator, the psychopath. So true. But while the sexual sadist does it in order to be gratified, so actually it's a form of self-love. Self-destruction, in the case of the sexual, sexual narcissistic sadist, self-destruction is self-love. It's a form of self-love. In the case of the psychopath, everything has no meaning, no real moti motivation. No psychodynamic background. It's kind of fleeting whim. It just, you know, it just wakes up. He does what he feels. It's he's kind of a shallow surface phenomenon, the psychopath. He has no depth. He's no dimensions. He's not gratified by, for example, drinking or by casual sex or by stealing someone's wallet or car or hurting someone hurting his so-called loved ones, nearest, dearest. Psychopath does things offhandedly, absent-mindedly, or because he feels like it. And he doesn't have to feel like it very much. It's enough that the thought crosses his mind and he would act on it. It's like a, a hair trigger variant of the, of the narcissistic sadist. And so psychopaths, are not motivated by self-gratification. Um, narcissistic say this are. It's a very crucial difference how to tell these two types apart. But what happens when you have all three? Psychopath, narcissist and sadist in the same body, in the same person, the same diagnosis. Well, it depends. In some situations, psychopath will take over, other situations, narcissist, and when it comes to sex, intimate partners and so on, probably the sadist. And so the thing is that in narcissism, exactly like in borderline, in narcissistic personality disorder, the same with borderline personality disorder, the psychopathic dimension is not primary psychopathy. It's secondary psychopathy. First, the narcissist or the borderline are triggered by something. The borderline is triggered by abandonment and rejection or anticipated abandonment and rejection. The narcissist is, is triggered by a narcissistic injury, lack of supply or mortification. First, there's a trigger. Only then the psychopath takes over as a defense mechanism, as a defense strategy. The psychopath then takes over in this case, and the narcissist and borderline act psychopathically, defiantly, without impulse control, without foreseeing or considering the consequences of their actions without empathy, callously, recklessly, etc., etc. These are all psychopathic behaviors, antisocial behaviors, but they come second. They are reactive to a primary psychodynamic process in the borderline, abandonment, anxiety, loss, anxiety, and in the narcissist, the need for supply um, and buttressing grandiosity. So, grooming and love bombing are integral parts of the strategies of narcissists, sadists, narcissistic sadists, and psychopaths to acquire targets, hoover, in case it's a second attempt, acquire or hoover targets who would later become accomplices, co-actors, co co colleagues, if you wish, in a production, in the theater production, of the narcissist's life, in the shared fantasy, in the shared psychotic space. These are never, never lens, like Michael Jackson's, <laughs> like Peter Pan's. These are the never, never lens in which a deeply wounded, deeply traumatized, sad, profoundly sad, and crying child of four years old wanders. He tries to find the way back to paradise, the way back to heaven, 
and it's paved with good intentions sometimes. But all he succeeds to do is hurt everyone around him, and his prime victim is himself. <laughs>